my name is Jessica Rutz, and I am the founder and president of the Rutz Foundation. So what inspired you to uh, join the Army? It was more of a, the, the whole family did it. So it was more following along the footsteps of what everybody else did prior. So how did, so from uh, finishing the Army to uh, creating this foundation, uh, can you take me through the steps of that? So uh, when it came to creating the Rutz Foundation, um, it sat and pondered with me um, for about two or three years because we watched the struggle, not only personally, but we I watched the struggles of battle buddies and friends and even spouses that were struggling and the assistance just wasn't there. Uh, personally, I had seeked um, help from a certain ent entity whenever I was discharged and I was turned away because I wasn't actively harming myself. And I was told that I needed to schedule an appointment and it was six to eight weeks out. So that kind of triggered with me and I was like, okay, so that doesn't work. You can't just leave people to sit there and wait six, eight, 12 weeks to get help. And since that day, that, that entity has gotten better. And I don't like to name them because we do work with them pretty closely, but they've gotten a lot better, um, I guess, with more ample funding and getting more caseworkers involved. However, um, our, our missions never change from helping our veterans and our soldiers. Um, however, we've added on help and family members, but we also had a volunteer and he worked very closely with us. Uh, he was in the Marine Corps. And when he exited the military in November of last year, he died by suicide eight days later because the help wasn't there to reintegrate him into civilian life. So it gives us a whole new outlook on it that if one of our volunteers can do it, then we still have a lot of work here to be done. So I was reading on your website that you've, you know, have thoughts as well. How is it bringing your, you know, personal uh, experience to help others? So I believe like when we bring in the personal aspect of it, um, we're here like for a crisis situation. We have um, licensed clinical social worker that can take a case immediately to talk to the person. Um, we're more about getting it done. We want to get it done prior to you going into crisis. However, if you go into crisis, we're here immediately and we're 24 seven. So there's never a moment where we're not going to take in um, a patient just because it could be six to eight weeks before they could get in somewhere else. And I think that's the biggest part I brought from my personal aspect was making it where everything's readily available. So can you tell me some of the, the programs you do? So we have, I was just going over it all again because we're actually implementing um, a few new ones this year and next year. But right now we have ours can be one-on-one -on -one or they can be in an actual um, group, whether it's in person or virtual. Um, I know that a lot of people don't prefer virtual anymore because after going through a pandemic where everything went virtual, it's just not, it's not helpful very much anymore. However, we do offer that aspect, especially for those that want it. We offer counseling. Um, and since starting, when we first started, we had actually partnered with an organization to do it for $6 um, where they could have a counseling session. And then it was, I think it was $24 a month to get them three counseling sessions and their medications. However, even though we're still partnered with them, we also have a licensed clinical social worker that can work with them as well instead of referring them outside to a different agency. Um, we offer a food bank. Um, it's, it's an ongoing process, so it's not going to be like your standard food bank uh, where you go a certain day a month. We actually take requests in and we answer the request within 24 hours. Um, we're planning more wellness activities. Um, it's been a bit of a bumpy start, especially when we started right before COVID and then COVID hit us. I believe it was like on our fourth month in, um, everything got shut down in our state. So we're slowly trying to recover from that. And then we do, um, the mental health appointments. If you need to go higher than our LCSW and go out to a psychiatrist or a therapist, we can refer out and we pay for those appointments as well as any medications that could come from those appointments. 
And one of the big events that we do each year is a Christmas for vets, which is where we buy our, we have certain families um, from around Virginia that apply and we do huge Christmas gifts. Like we try to take care of their family so that they can have a brighter holiday season. And one that's not really a program, but we do it each year is our race to end vet suicide. It's a day that we bring awareness and promote prevention in veteran suicide, as well as um, military family suicide and soldier suicide. So, and, oh, oh no, go ahead. Uh, keep, you can keep going. Sorry. One of the biggest things that we are working on launching in 2023 is that we're going to have our own crisis line. So when someone goes into crisis and they need to call in, we will have a staff support center that will answer those crisis calls. Wow, that's that's huge. How important is it once you leave the military to have a strong support system? So I believe that it's 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 dire. Like it's it's very much needed because being in the military and like I watch uh, my spouse, he he's still in. And there's moments he's like, oh, well, I'm fine. I don't, I don't need to go do this or I don't need to go do that or talk to the VA or talk to a doctor. And the, it's just like the little moments that I can observe. And I'm just like, but you really do. And we've, um, I've taken a lot of mental health classes. So looking over like just different ticks that can happen and uh, anybody could see them, but no one is looking for them. So when you have your support system, a lot of people know what to look for and what to watch for. And if you don't have that support system, then you're just sitting there by yourself. So uh, I saw that uh, on your website, you're, you're doing what you can to end the stigma. Uh, I, I live with uh, mental illness, uh, bipolar disorder too. And, you know, I agree trying to end the stigma. Have you seen any progress in people, you know, being able to emphasize, uh, empathize more. Sorry, I had a child running. Um, <laughs> so when it comes to the stigma, I, I still see a big, like with inside of like active military or active reserves, I see a bigger stigma placed on it there than I do in the outside world, but there are still, um, a lot of progress. There is still a lot of progress that can be made to bring that stigma down. So I, I can see it being worked on and I can see more people being accepting of it. Um, but I still see a lot of grounds for working on it because not, not everybody understands mental health. Like it's not, it's not just suicidal ideations. It's not just wanting to die by suicide. And that's one word. So that's one thing that we've switched from saying we don't, um, no one in my household or family says, um, committed suicide. We all say died by because that's one thing that breaks it away from the stigma as well, because they didn't commit a crime. They died by their own hand. So um, we try to change that part of the stigma as well. So what are some of the things that motivate you? Just saving people. Like I don't feel that anybody should have to fight their demons alone. And I, I truly don't believe that anybody should have to die by one of the most preventable deaths in the world. So where do you want to see the organization in the next uh, five years? I want to see progress. I want to see that we can, I know that with COVID, it raised our suicide rate numbers. Um, the VA hasn't released 2020 or 2021. And I know it's because that they're so high that they're still trying to gather those numbers. However, I want to, I want to see those numbers come down. We were in 2019, it was fluctuating between 20 and 22 a day. And now we're fluctuating between 27 and 28 a day. So instead of going down, we are trending up and I get it was because of the pandemic. So now we had to figure out how to get mental health back on track and bring the awareness and prevention to bring that number down within the next five years. I would like to at least see it down to 15 to 16 a day. And that's, that's still a lot of people every day that take their lives to suicide. And that's just veterans. That's not counting the population as a whole. So what advice would you give uh, 
military members once they uh, leave the military? Stay on top of your appointments. Even if you don't think that you need it because you feel fine today, there's always the chance that you won't feel fine tomorrow. So whether it's going to the VA or it's seeking an outside source, stay on top of your appointments and make sure that you get your mental health checks and follow the self-care recommendations. Um, Self-care can be 10 minutes of you just sitting and reading with yourself each day, and that could make a world of a difference. Um, Self-care, mental health care, it's all vitally important. So how can people reach out to you? So we are on Facebook. Um, It's www.facebook.com forward slash Rutz Foundation. And we also have the RutzFoundation.org. We have our um, phone line right now, which is 540-848-4680. Had to think about that for a minute. I don't call myself enough. (laughs) Um, We also have the info at RutzFoundation.org where you can submit different requests if you need assistance or if you need to speak with somebody and you don't want to make the phone call. Um, We have several different communication methods. Sunita Baldi, and I'm the Chief Development and Communications Officer at Project Hope. So how did you get involved with Project Hope? Well, I've known for Project Hope, about Project Hope for many years. Uh, I worked in the sector for the last 10 years, and I remember them as a child, actually. Uh, They used to have the end of the night spot on TV, and you'd see the ship going down uh, the New York Harbor. And so I just kind of watched them evolve over the years and um, decided that I wanted to come work here, be a part of the mission. So can you uh, tell me a little bit of an overview about Project Hope? Yes. So we are a 64-year-old organization. We are an international NGO based in Washington, D.C., We work in about 26 countries around the world, and that can vary at different times, depending on what's going on and uh, where our programs are. Um, We have really, we started out our mission really with the ship. A lot of people are familiar with the Project Hope ship. And our first mission was to Indonesia. And we would send doctors and nurses in to countries that were considered marginalized countries and needed really system strengthening for their, for their healthcare systems. We have since transitioned. We are a land-based organization. We do have regional teams throughout the, the globe uh, who work in different regions from Africa to Indonesia to South America, Central America. And our focus, our ultimate focus is really to empower and help strengthen healthcare workers training and systems in the countries that they live and work. So really to help build sustainable solutions in the countries that we work in from the local uh, perspective first and foremost. And we do that in different areas uh, of global health. So we have a focus on infectious diseases. We have a very large USAID PEPFAR funded HIV program in Africa. Uh, We also worked very, very uh, closely with many corporations and foundations in the State Department for COVID. Uh, We helped respond to COVID both in the early days and throughout the last two years. We still have a, a pretty big program in the US working with free and charitable clinics in the South of the US. Uh, We also um, have a very large program in Ukraine and in the host countries, Poland, Romania, Moldova. And uh, that's really around humanitarian crises, working in complex crises. Additionally, we work in um, maternal and neonatal care in two of the largest Um, neonatal mortality countries in the world, which are Dominican Republic and then Sierra Leone in Africa. 
And that is a long standing program that we do there as well. Um, so that's kind of a, a top level overview really of, of what we do. So you brought up uh, the UK, Ukraine crisis. How important not only for physical health is, you know, help these people with mental health because it's some of the worst days of their lives. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do in the humanitarian sector around either humanitarian crises or natural disasters too, um, there is a very, very strong mental health psychosocial support component to that. I think we often tend to not think about that when we're thinking about responding, you know, in an immediate crisis. And yet that is the true long-standing damage that's done to people, to human beings. Um, and so it's a big part of our work. It's a big part of our work in Ukraine right now and in the host countries. Um, we have just received funding to open up nine different um, centers throughout the region that will help with psychosocial support. Um, it's it's a, a huge need for a variety of different reasons from having the trauma and the shock of having to leave your home, you know, your husbands, your, your fathers, your, the, the males really that had to stay behind to fight all the way to just that long-term um, trauma that, that sets in um, the anxiety of not knowing what's next when you get to go home, what's going to happen to you next, not feeling safe. So it's a big part of our work. It's a big part of our work during crises. And um, it's you know, something that we continue to look into in terms of what more can we do. So uh, for you personally, how does it feel that you know, you're a part of an organization that is making a difference? Oh, it, it's my passion. I feel very fortunate to have a career and do something every day that I love that is near and dear to me. Um, I grew up with parents who worked in both humanitarian work, climate change, climate change and health impacts. And I started out my career in the corporate sector. And so moving to not only the nonprofit sector, but into global health and humanitarian work is kind of like the perfect combination of bringing my upbringing, my passion and interests and my career together. So I feel really fortunate. I um, get extremely energized going and visiting our beneficiaries, our programs in the field, seeing the work firsthand. Um, I have two young children. I constantly talk to them about the importance of being humanitarians, caring about the planet, caring about human beings. Um, and I hope that my career is, is really ultimately my legacy to my children. You brought it up, but can you tell me a little bit about when you're on the ground firsthand, what it's like? Well, it varies depending on where you where you are, where you're going, um, where you're visiting. There's everything from um, you know just the the logistics of getting in. There's oftentimes language differences. Um, you're really looking to see firsthand what it is that your mission and your funders are funding. And the impact of lives that that's changing. Um, it's extremely moving. I've never once come back from the field and felt like it wasn't a life changing experience to see the work, to really understand on a global impact what the needs are. You know, we, we are very fortunate um, in our country. And then to actually feel like you're making a difference and that you're helping other people. They're kind of, you know, there is no greater feeling. Um, I have been in areas where there is a humanitarian crisis. I've been in areas where I've gone back and met with people a year after a natural disaster. The, the two things that I think I see over and over again is 
there's longstanding mental health and psychosocial support needs. Uh, these things don't just go away when they're gone from the media or gone from the funders' minds. Are you know the people around the world who have been impacted continue to have to you know struggle and work through how their life has been upturned. Uh, the other thing to the counterbalance of that is I've seen the most resilient people in the world too. I have seen refugees from South Sudan that have crossed over and watched family members being shot in front of them and go to another country and try to make a living and build resources for their young children and to, to rebuild their families and their lives. I've seen people in earthquake zones, tsunami zones who have pushed through after they've lived through a horrifying life loss disaster and they have pushed through and they continue to push through. So the resilience is really a beautiful thing that you get to witness when you're in the field as well, seeing our work around the world. So, so the last thing I want to ask with the, the organization always evolving, where do you want to see it in the next uh, five years? Well, we have grown quite a bit over the last three years. And I am really excited about the team, our CEO, the team that we have in place. Uh, I think Ukraine was a perfect example of this team. The team's expertise and having worked in these types of environments coming together quickly to address a need within hours. Um, I think big, you know, longer term, the next five years, I, I would love to see us continue to grow to continue to grow funding, our mission to be able to do more programs. We have an amazing cadre of technical experts. And so our ability to give back and to continue to do the work and then scale it on a larger level is a really exciting opportunity for our organization right now. Mm -hmm.